Obviously, some that are not able to be with us due to work uh, requirements or due to uh, some sickness going around. Some are still traveling. Uh, some may be still on their way here, so if you keep those in prayer. If you'd like to pray for one of the prayer sheets there on the wooden table there in the foyer, uh, please pick those up and pray for each other and for the needs of our church. Also on the back is the announcements for the church, so to keep you abreast. You can also go onto our website and follow along as well with the announcements and sermons and whatnot. That's in BaptistChurchMaine.org. But as we go and prepare ourselves to go to worship, let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. My Father, we come before you and we ask that you would calm our hearts. Father, help us to as we come before you this morning, help us to know you today. Father, help us not only to know you, but not to be a God of our own imagination, but the God of the Bible. For you will say, Moses has said in Exodus chapter 15, who is like unto thee, O Lord. And there is no one like thee. The only way we know you is you have revealed yourself to us through your word. And Father, we thank you for that. So again, Father, we ask that you would calm our hearts, calm our minds this morning. We may have come in here and we may have our own struggles, our own afflictions, our own trials of our life. And it may be discouraging, it may be depressing. But Father, you are working it out, as we learned in Sunday school, as the wise and good husbandman who prunes the branches of the vine. And so these things may have come into our lives and it may tempt us to sin. Father, you may allow these things also to come into our lives to test our faith. Lord, we ask for your help this morning as it is testing and trying our faith this morning that we would trust you and you alone, for you are worthy to be praised. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. As we go to worship this morning, Moses says in Exodus chapter 15, verse 1, And then sang Moses and the children of Israel the song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Down to verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praising, doing wonders? So let us sing to this Lord this morning. O for a thousand tongues to sing. Let us say it again. 291 in your red hymnal. Hymn 291. <laughs> Seated. If you'd like to sing our psalm with us this morning, Psalm. 
Psalm 119G in the red hymnal, your word remember to your needy servant, your word remember to your needy servant. Play through that for us one time. Over the seat to thee, 
who laughs on the pass over his feet and his pillar unto me for harm. The God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge betwixt us, and Jacob swear by the fear of his father Isaac. Then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount, and called his brethren to eat bread, and they did not bread, and carried the wine in the mount. And early in the morning Laban rose up and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them, and Laban departed and returned unto his place. Thank you. you. May be seated. May the Lord add a blessing to his word being read this morning. Let us sing him 525, hymn 525 in the red hymnal. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Thessalonians chapter 3, we're looking at verses 6 through verse 18. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 18. If you'd like to follow along in the Pew Bibles, page 1667 and 1668. If you are able to, let us stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll do this one in unison, verses 6 through verse 18. Let's begin with verse number 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. 
For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace all the ways by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. May the Lord add a blessing to his word being read this morning. This time we'll have the ushers come forth to take up the offering. The ushers come forth to take up the offering. Um, we just started this last week. If you'd like to give, you are more than welcome to give in the offering plate. We also have the box there in the foyer, so if you'd like to give in the box, you're more than welcome to do that as well. And Dennis, would you ask for blessing on sure. the offering? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for another opportunity to give back to you what you have given each one of us so much, far more than we could ever give back. We just ask you to bless this offering to meet the needs of your church and multiply it we ask it all in the holy, precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us sing, Guide Me O Thy Great Jehovah in Black Queen. to some of you, to all of us, uh, that has been a, a wonderful study uh, through the lives of the patriarchs. And as we think about chapter 47 this morning, Paul asks a question in 1 Corinthians that I would like for us to consider as we move through 
chapter 47 this morning. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he asks a question. Actually, it's a part of a series of questions he asks the church at Corinth. And as he's asking this question, I want us to think about these, the answer to this as we move forward. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Look, the context, if you would, if you want to back up to verse 14 for a moment, is being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? You think about the question, you think about the context. What's the application then? He says that in verse 17 and 18. He says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Separation. We've talked about this on numerous occasions throughout the book of Genesis. That Genesis is, uh, the title means beginnings. And this is the beginning of uh, many of the doctrines we find throughout scripture. And we find the beginnings of, in seed form, if you will, in chapter 47, this idea of separation. And as we see Israel living in Egypt, they're being in the world, but not of the world. We will deal with that this morning as we uh, move through Genesis chapter 47. But before we do, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning, and as we come to the sermon part of the service, we ask for your help. Father, we ask for your help to help us see you in the Word. Father, we also ask that you would allow the Holy Spirit to move in and among us freely, softening our hearts so that you may engraft the word to our hearts this morning. Father, allow the Spirit to illuminate the scriptures for us so that we may see and hear and understand. And all these things we ask in your Son's name. Amen. But what Paul is getting to the church at Corinth what we see in seed form this morning in Genesis 47 is it is about sanctification. Not being like others, being holy, says the Lord. He, he says in a series of quotations, if we were to go to Isaiah, and he talks about this in a series of quotations in Isaiah, uh, right before you get to the suffering servant song of Isaiah 53. Uh, many people know that passage of scripture, but many people don't know what is saying before you get to that portion of scripture. But when he says in Isaiah 52, verse 11, he says, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. That's the same phrase that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians. He pulls it from Isaiah 52. And he continues, Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. Again, the context for us there is, is verse 10, helping us understand what he's saying in verse 11. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. He will save you, he says, so because he saves you, you must be holy. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 34. And I will bring you out from the people, and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand, and with a stretched out arm, there's the picture of the arm again, and with fury poured out. Who's Ezekiel writing to? He's actually talking about the nation of Egypt here in chapter 20, verses 34. We'll look at verse 35 and 36 now. He says there in verse 35, and I will bring you into the wilderness of people. There will I plead you with face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. So what is the, what, what is the point of us discussing these verses before we get into chapter 47? We, we made the point of separation. We, we talked about sanctification. 
But the point is, is not God doesn't just save us to save us. He saves us then to sanctify himself, a people unto him, who are thankful and will glorify him. He separates his people out from others so that they might actually be and act separate from the nations. Back to Paul again, 2 Corinthians verse 6 and 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He goes then to chapter 7 verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved... Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. As we think about the, the very first verse which we looked at, verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? For what part hath he believeth with an infidel? And many of us, it makes us think about our own future. But as we begin to think about the other context of the other quotes, which we pulled from Scripture to help us understand that particular portion of Scripture, there's something far greater going on here. That it's not just that it is about me, or just about you, but it should make us think about the cross. And we'll get to that momentarily, but the roots, again, the, the seed form, the roots of this separation are found in Genesis. I mean, if you would go all the way back to Genesis chapter 5, there is an um, implicit thought there that there are two different lines of people. There's the line of Cain and the line of Seth. There are godly people. There are godless people. And we see that throughout the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've seen that, have we not? We've, we've, been, we've also seen throughout these narratives that there has been an emphasis put on that the nation of Israel in this seed form, this family, does not mix with the Canaanites. They are to be separate. There is a need for the promised seed of Abraham not to be mixed with foreigners. But again, we see this seed being found, the real beginnings of this being found here in Genesis chapter 47. And it can, it's basically a continuation of Genesis chapter 46 from last Sunday evening. If you remember in chapter 46, or if you have read it, uh, Jacob picks up from his homeland of Canaan. He, this is an old man. He's about 130 at this point in time. I, I ain't moving at 30, much less 130. I can't imagine moving at 130, but he does. He picks up his entire family, everything that belongs to him, all of his cattle, all of his herds, all of his servants, they all go with him. He, he comes to Egypt and he, he has finally presented his son, whom he thought has been dead for the last 20-something years. Can you, I mean, can you imagine what's going through this elderly gentleman's mind? He's picking up everything that he's ever known, lived in a place he's ever known, and he's going to a place he's never seen in hopes to see a son who he thought has been dead for 20-something years, who his, his sons have lied to him for the last 20-something years, and now his sons are telling him his son is alive. I mean, the mixed emotions that this man is going through. But he comes to Egypt, he sees Joseph. And we were left at a cliffhanger in chapter 46. So now what do we do with this nation of Israel? What do we do with these 70 people? What do we do with the 70 sons of Israel who are homeless? Who are at the mercy now of one of the greatest ancient world powers in Egypt? We're left to wonder, what, 
is going to happen to Israel. Remember, this is all happening also in the midst of a famine, a terrible famine. How are they going to survive? How are they going to stay separated as the promise has already been sent back to Abraham and Isaac? How are they going to become a nation? But we see the fulfillment of these questions, the answer to these questions, over a period of two stages in chapter 47. So in the first stage, you'll see Israel exalted, verses 1 through 12. In verse number 2 of this passage of scripture, Joseph and five brothers are coming to have an audience with Pharaoh. Joseph is going to ask, act as a mediator, as a liaison between the, the brothers and the king Pharaoh. Which is interesting at this point, is just as much as the nation of Israel, or Joseph and his brothers, look to Pharaoh as unclean, as an abomination, the Egyptians will look on Israel as the same way, as an abomination, as unclean. So Joseph presents his brothers, his five brothers to Pharaoh. And as Joseph predicted, Pharaoh's going to ask them the occupation. He asks them, as predicted in chapter 46, verse 33, Pharaoh wants to know about these new people coming into his land. He wonders what they're going to do. How are they going to help in the midst of this famine? And, and I will say this at the forefront. This, this chapter is uh, deeply saturated in economics and politics. So if that is your uh, jive this morning, I hope that you'll be able to see that. We won't get into all of that, but that is part of what we're looking at this morning. But they are told they are shepherds. In Egyptian culture, shepherds were detested. Shepherds were an abomination. Shepherds were loathsome to the Egyptians. So Joseph preps the Pharaoh, and Joseph preps the brothers, and he tells the brothers to be brutally honest to Pharaoh. The goal was to have the family stop in Goshen, and then because of them stopping there, the Pharaoh's going to ask what they do, why are they there? You tell them right up front that you are shepherds. As one commentator says, he says he would have them to live by themselves, separate as much as might be from the Egyptians in the land of Goshen, which lay nearest to Canaan, and which perhaps was more thinly peopled by the Egyptians, and well furnished with the pastures for cattle. He, meaning Pharaoh, desired that they might live separately, that they might be in less danger both of being infected by the vices of the Egyptians and of being insulted by the malice of the Egyptians. So there's almost a detest on both sides of this equation. The nation of Israel doesn't want to have any interactions with the nation of Egypt. The Egyptians look at them as detestable and loathsome because they are shepherds. But this for us begins the analogy which we looked at this morning. That Christians are to be in the world but not of it. Verse 4. They said moreover unto Pharaoh who to sojourn in the land are we come. For thy servants have no pasture for their flocks for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. There's two terms that we're going to see kind of interact throughout this passage of Scripture that kind of help us make the connections as we move forward. Uh, one is famine, which we'll look at it more in detail later. And the other idea is to sojourn. Is Israel coming here, and this is going to be their permanent house, this permanent home? This is supposed to be a temporary Engagement. This is supposed to be temporary. They're coming here on a temporary basis. They, they ask, let thy servants dwell. 
Now this is important for us to understand because we need to start understanding the Israel-Egyptian uh, relationship before you even get into Exodus. 47 is laying the groundwork for how we are to view Exodus in chapters 1 and following. Pharaoh responds in verse 6. Let's look at that. The land of Egypt is before thee, and the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. Thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. I mean, look how generous Pharaoh is. They, are, they come to Egypt as free men. And they were freely given the best of the land of Egypt. But their temporary sojourning, as you would see just a few chapters later in Exodus chapter 1, would be forced permanent in slavery. Shows the wickedness of the Pharaoh that comes after this Pharaoh. But it also sets up the second half of the story today. Because it begins to set up this, this irony, if you will, when we consider the future slavery of Egypt as opposed to the slavery of the Egyptians in this chapter. But we have to step back and ask a question for, for, uh, for this moment in time, this morning, is why is Pharaoh so generous? Right? He's one of the biggest rulers of all the ancient known world. And these are the people that are coming to him for food and a place to live. Why would he just to give these random strangers the best possible place to live? I mean, I mean is there a catch to what's going on with Pharaoh? But the answer is in how Pharaoh views Joseph. You see in verse 5, And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. Joseph has, has risen to such an important position in the nation of, Israel, uh, nation of Egypt due to his honesty, due to his wisdom, due, due to how God has been working in Joseph's life. There's an obvious sense that God, the God of Israel, is with Joseph. And for these things, Pharaoh loves him like a son. But if, if we were to bring this thought into our, our world this morning for a moment. There are too many Christians out there think that the only reason they are employed is that they are there to evangelize that they're only there to evangelize their co-workers. But often the case with these people is their work often suffers because they just don't see it as very important. But if you think about the life of Joseph, winning over someone through hard work and integrity of character is a much better way to get a hearing on the day it is truly needed. Whether it's giving the gospel, or whether it's helping them in a physical manner. But not only that, God delights in the hard work of a believer. God delights in the integrity. The end of everything that we know of as a believer is to glorify God in everything. Joseph is doing well because he is doing his work the best way he knows how, through integrity, through character, through smarts, and it's having an impact on how Pharaoh looks at his family. But not only does Pharaoh is generous to these, to these strangers in this land, but he gives them the best of the land, Goshen. You see that in verse 11. It's located in the fertile farmland of one of the eastern forks of the Nile River. If you look up a picture of Egypt and you see the Nile River there in the northern part of Egypt, it's off one of these forks is the land of Goshen. 
the, that area of Egypt would be the only place in Egypt that was able to produce grassland uh, for livestock and herds. I mean, think about the providence of God at this point. Jacob and all of his household is hungry. They come to Egypt to gain more food so that they could go back to Canaan, and God provides them a home, and he provides them jobs in Egypt. Pharaoh offers them all jobs. He gives them privileges within the Egyptian government beyond just being foreigners. It allows the brothers uh, to continue to care for the families, and they can continue to carry out the blessing to be fruitful and multiply, verse 27. Isn't it amazing when God promises us something, he's going to carry it out? God has promised Joseph 27 years prior that his, his siblings and his father is going to bow before him. God has promised the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he's going to bless them. That they're going to be a blessing to other nations. That they're going to multiply. They're going to be as the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven. But can you imagine God being faithful to his promises in this way? That God is going to bring the nation of Israel out of Israel, the promised land, brings them to Egypt and blesses them in Egypt instead of Israel. But God is still faithful to his promises. It may not be in the time that we want it in, and it may not be in the way that we want it in, but God is still faithful to his promises. After the brothers have their moment with Pharaoh, Jacob gets his uh, audience with Pharaoh now, verses 7 through 10. You get a picture of a very different man in these few verses than we have seen throughout the rest of his life previous. It is both majestic and tragic both at the same time. I mean, this is the last great patriarch of the nation of Israel. He is brought before Pharaoh. He stands by his son in the palace throne room. And there's a conversation that ensues between Pharaoh and Jacob. I mean, think about it. And this man is 130 years old, having this conversation with Pharaoh. J Pharaoh basically is asking him kind of, kind of break the ice type question, how, how old are you? Pharaoh realizes this man is old, but he wants to know how old Jacob is. That was verse 8. In, in verse 9, Jacob says, The days of my sojourning are 130 years. For 130 years, Jacob has always been wandering. He's never had a place to call home. The book of Hebrews puts it this way in chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, Dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Jacob has been wandering this earth for 130 years. He's been sojourning in a land that is promised to be his, but isn't his yet. He's a pilgrim in this weary world. He tells the Pharaoh, I'm 130 years old and I have lived a life of wandering. But what allows Jacob to keep going, living a life of wandering? The writer of Hebrews tells us he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was looking far beyond the physical reality. He was looking to a heavenly reality that God is his inheritance. But this is something that is repeated throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament that if we are to follow Christ, we may have to give up everything. But 
Would we give up everything to follow Christ? Jacob continues in verse 9 of chapter 47. The days of the years of my pilgrimages are 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and I have not attain, attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. As one commentator thinking about the life of Jacob, he, he writes, For Jacob spent all his time in servitude, working as a hireling amid dangers and plots and deceits and fears. And when he was asked by Pharaoh, he says, Few and evil have my days been. I mean, think about it. Jacob, there's this, this great contrast between Pharaoh, who's lived a life of security, of blessing, of prosperity, and the life of Jacob, who's, who's all the time work, trying to work out through deceits. He's been uh, deceived. Been de he's deceived. He's had different plots. He's had different dangers. He's lived with different fears. He's a wanderer. But you have these two great contrasts, these two great people. Jacob is reflecting on, on all the, his old age. He's reflecting on the hardships of his life. I mean, think about it. He, he, he was uh, always disagreeable with Esau. He's had difficulties with his brothers later. There was the treachery of Laban. There was the fighting amongst his wives. There was the rape of his daughter, the death or the supposed death of Joseph. And that's just touching the surface of Jacob's life. I mean, we, you think about your life now and only the, the trials you're going through, the tribulations you're going through. And you compare it to what Jacob has gone through, and sometimes our life doesn't seem that bad. The ravages of sin are, are taking a hold on the post-flood world. Jacob is acknowledging that he's not living as long as his father or his grandfather. And we realize that even today that life is but a breath. Nobody's living to 130 today. Life is but a breath. It's a vapor and then it's gone. And yet, why, do we, why are we living a life so conflicted where we, we trust God in one sense in this area and not trust God in another sense in another area of life? Jacob's the same way. He's conflicted. But we've seen the conflict of his decisions and his lack of decision-making towards God throughout his life. And this is a conflicted individual. He comes to the end of his life and it's conflicted. And he's weary. He's tired of living. Jacob ends his time in the presence of Pharaoh. And Jacob blesses Pharaoh. I mean, if you were to stop and think for a moment, it should have been the other way around. Pharaoh is the the greater in this, this picture, this, this point of time, just looking on the outside, looking in, Pharaoh is the king of the, one of the greatest nations of the ancient world. This is Jacob coming in, a 130-year-old man. He just has 70 children. And at the end of the conversation between Pharaoh and Jacob, Jacob is the one who blesses Pharaoh, not Pharaoh blessing Jacob. But Jacob is just out, is living out the promises of God towards Pharaoh. I mean, take us all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, right? He, God tells Abram to leave, and he tells him, I'm going to make a promise with you because you are going to bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That was 200 years prior to what Jacob just said in Genesis chapter 47, and yet God is still faithful to his promises. Even 200 years later,
the scene wraps up in verses 11 and 12. It act goes along with how Joseph has already said. Joseph placed his father and his brethren, verse 11, and gave them possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Verse 12, And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. I mean, you think about verse 12 and then you think about the rest of the chapter. and It's amazing how God and his providence provides for his people despite this terrible, wicked famine. God's people lack for nothing. But you get an almost a dramatic difference of a story in verses 13 through the end of the chapter. Forty-seven one through twelve is, is is the backdrop, the, the contrast between Israel and Egypt. Remember, famine was going to come up, and this is the, one of the key terms we find in this chapter that kind of uh, ties the two ends of the chapter together. Verse four, he, they say there in chapter forty-seven, they said, "Well, we'll to Pharaoh." The brothers speaking to Pharaoh, "For the sojourn and the land are become for thy servants have no pasture for thy flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan." Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Verse 13 gives us another commentary on the famine in Egypt. But this is from the Egyptians' perspective. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. That's how awesome it is that God is providing for his people despite how tragic this famine is. It says the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan is basically a wasteland. Think 1930s Dust Bowl. But as you begin in verse 14, there's a series of three events that progressively harm the Egyptian people. In verse 14, Joseph gathers all the money in Egypt. The famine is raging on to this point now. Remember, it's, we had seven years of plenty. We're in the middle of seven years of famine. The people are now taking everything that they have, all, all their money, and they're trying to buy grain just so they can stay alive. But this effect had something incredibly, ha incredibly happened. Is what happens is this Pharaoh is taking all of the Egyptians' money. And so this is making him an incredibly wealthy individual and causing his citizens to be incredibly poor. Joseph is gathering the money in verse 14. The people plead for food in verse 15. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence, for the money faileth? I mean, this is economic hard times now. The currency of society is failing. The men, the men and women of society are dying, are, are close to death because they cannot afford food. And they come to Joseph begging for food. But it also kind of reminds you of the nation of Israel as they're wandering in the wilderness, does it not? That, you know, the Egyptians say, why should we die in my presence, Joseph? Exodus chapter 14, verse 11. And they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? And Numbers chapter 11, verse 5. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But you brought us out to the wilderness to die. So verse 17, the people begin to bring their livelihoods now to Joseph. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, and for the flocks, and for the cattle of the herd, and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. So no longer do they have any money to trade for food, so now they're bringing all of their livestock 
anything that they could grab, grab their hands on, and they're giving it to Pharaoh so that he could provide food for them. But this is, again, setting us up for the book of Exodus. And this is how Pharaoh becomes so powerful in Exodus chapters 1 and following. But then verse 18 tells us there's no end in sight. Famine is still getting worse. The people are complaining again. They say, you have your money. You have our animals. And this is important to the story. This is their idea. It says, eat. Verses 18 and 19. They said unto Joseph, We will not hide it from my Lord how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath all of our herds of our cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? By us, notice the thought here. Pharaoh and Joseph, buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. I mean, you just see how tragic this is. The, the nations, Egypt, the Egyptian people have got to a point where they have no more money, they have no more way of making money, and now they're offering their land and their bodies as servants to Pharaoh so that they may live and eat. You see verses 20 through 22. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt even to the other end thereof. Only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their land. Verse 23 basically sums it up. He's basically, Joseph tells them that I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Here's your seed, and ye shall sow the land. Part of the bargain was now that Pharaoh owns all the land and all the crops and all the people, whatever they made on the land, 20% belongs to Pharaoh. I mean, think, what, look at the people's response in verse 25. Remember, this is their idea. They, they pitched to Joseph and to Pharaoh. The people's response, thou hast saved our lives, verse 25. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servant. As we think about this contrast now this morning between Egypt and Israel. I mean, obviously, I mean, this, from this point forward, we can go in a variety of different directions. And then people may want to talk about the policies of Joseph. Is this right and just towards the people of Egypt? There's principles of economics and ethics here given to us about how we are to deal with uh, famines in the land. But we must remember that this is a there's a reason for us seeing this story and its location within Scripture. But the purpose isn't so much whether we need to think about it in politics and economics, which you can do on your own. But the, pro the, the thought process is here is why would God put this in Scripture? Well, what is it about this passage of Scripture that teaches us about God? This is it's supposed to get us to thinking about, okay... These 70 people from Canaan are now in Goshen, seemingly prospering despite the rest of the land of Egypt in this terrible famine. 
is so bad that they have given all their money to the government, giving all of their food to the government, and giving their bodies and lands to the government. They willingly became slaves. But it, it, it should start to think, that, okay, we have the slavery idea now. It should take us into Exodus for a moment, right? Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. We know that the story of Genesis is the beginnings and it, it carries over into the book of Exodus. But how did things so dramatically change in the land of Egypt to where the Egyptians are no longer enslaved, but the Israelites are enslaved now? In Exodus, while in Genesis 47, the Egyptians are enslaved and Israel's not enslaved. How does things go dramatically change in some 400 years? We can say it this way. In Genesis, the Egyptians were the slaves, and Jacob was the free man. In Exodus, the Israelites have become the slaves. This is the, the question, the overarching question that this passage is driving us to. Why is this happening? It tells us at the end of the chapter, verses 28 and following, that Israel settles in the land of Egypt, they gained possessions and were fruitful and multiplied. And that is the major reason for them becoming enslaved in Exodus chapter 1, verse 7. God, God was blessing them on the account of being fruitful and multiplying. They were prospering in the land there in the delta. And it became such a problem that the Pharaoh at the time of the Exodus thought that he needed to... Uh, succumb the, pro uh, the prosperity in Israel at that time and bring it for Egypt himself. But what's also hard for us sometimes to wrap our mind around is, but this is all God's plan to begin with. <clears throat> what's interesting is Jacob lived 17 more years after uh, this interaction with Pharaoh. Genesis chapter 47, verse 29. If you recall, God was the one who orchestrated the seven years of prosperity and the seven years of famine. It is God who, who declared to Isaiah in Isaiah 45, 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. In, in that passage of scripture, evil is not evil as we see in sinning, but evil as in like calamities, famines. If you want to use the word for what we're looking at in Genesis chapter 47. I, the Lord, do all of these things. Why would God do this? God used the circumstances of life to compel Jacob and the nation of Israel to go to Egypt so they could be enslaved for 400 years. But why? So he could bring them out of Egypt to redeem them and the people so that they can worship in the wilderness. He allows the nation of Israel to prosper for 400 years, fall under slavery, and then bring them out of Egypt in the Exodus. But we see this throughout, the, throughout Scripture, how God uses the circumstances of life to prepare his people for another point in life. I mean, we see it on this side of the New Testament now looking back, don't we? We see how, and take for instance the Gospels, how God, how God uses lives of different individuals that get to a point and all of a sudden Christ appears on the scene and they are now saved by faith. I 
I mean, think about Zacchaeus for a moment. Zacchaeus is a ruthless tax collector. But he has to see Jesus. So, I mean, we know the story, don't we? He climbs the sycamore tree. We can sing the song. The kids can probably sing the song. Christ comes up to him. He lays eyes on Zacchaeus. And he says, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to go to your house today. A life-changing event for Zacchaeus. And essentially, we could say that was the beginning of Zacchaeus' spiritual life. That this, the interaction with Christ, the beginning of life. But this is how God works in all of our lives, does he not? He, he brings, he uses the circumstances of life to bring us to, to, to a point where he can pour his grace out on our life. And as we talked about in Sunday school, we, are, we become persistent objects of the husbandman from John chapter 15. Looking at our lives, pruning us so that we may bear fruit. And as God's children, we, we become persistent. He, he persistently brings us through everything, good or bad, so that he can be pour out his grace on us. Joseph says at the end of Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Who in their ever wildest dreams could have thought that something good could have come out of their brothers selling Joseph and his slavery? But God can use those circumstances in life to bring something good. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. All means all, not just good things. Terrible things, tragic things, sinful things, all things God uses for his good in our lives. Why wouldn't we want to trust this God? We see the, the, the final death scene in, in Genesis chapter 47, verses 29 and 30. This is the scene Jacob with these words. As the time drew nigh that Israel must die, and he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bear me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bear me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. Jacob knows that he's not going to be leaving the land of Egypt. Jacob knows that the Israelites now are going to be here for a very long time. God was faithful to his promises in the days of Jacob. Eventually, we see just a few chapters later in Exodus chapter 1, the Israelites are going to find themselves as slaves to a much harder taskmaster than Joseph. This would be the impetus for the great Exodus, which we know of. God brings them down here, in one sense, to save them, but he brings them down to to this point in Egypt so that they can be enslaved so that he can take them out of slavery. But as we reflect on the story for the last few minutes this morning, what, what are some things that come to your mind this morning as we think through this? They think over the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph up to this point. What goes through your mind? What comes to your mind as we, we think about how God is healing his people?
few things come to my mind. I mean, we could add to this list if we had more time. In order for us to approach God's law properly, we must become a slave to Christ. When we were thinking about the slavery of the Egyptians, the slavery of the Israelites, we must become a slave to Christ. The New Testament isn't about freedom. The New Testament is about moving from one master to another. From moving from one cruel taskmaster who's demonic to a taskmaster whose burden is easy and light. Either way, it's servitude or slavery at the same time. We must realize that Christ is king, and we must all bow the knee to him. We must give him our lives and all that we have. Because we can't serve two masters. Jesus tells us on the Sermon on the Mount, you cannot serve God and mammon. So we're either going to serve God willingly or serve Christ our King willingly, or we will bow the knee on Judgment Day when we are forced to acknowledge Christ as King. Secondly, situations are constantly changing, are they not? But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And because God is the same, he is faithful to his promises. And when we say that, we must also recognize when we say that God is faithful to his promises, that it does not always come by the way we want or in the time that we want. We should have learned this through Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob. These men have been promised all of these things, and they have yet to see seeing any sense of accomplishment of those promises. But that doesn't mean that God didn't keep his promises. We just also understand that we cannot stop the forces of nature, like a famine, in Genesis chapter 47. We can't stop the forces of politics, how Pharaoh is consolidating power in Genesis chapter 47. Or we can't even stop sometimes our own decisions. We will become your slaves, as in Genesis chapter 47. But the amazing thing is, is despite what is going on around us, despite our own decisions, despite how things aren't working out the way we see fit, God is in control in the midst of every one of those items. And he has a purpose to those who love him and have been called by him. But do you love this God? Not the God of your own imagination, this God. The God of the Bible. Are you trusting in this Christ, the one that you need to admit that you are a sinful creature and repent of your sins this day? And finally this, this morning, that because God is faithful, and he deals with his promises the way he sees fit. He saves us. He sanctifies us. He watches over us. He calls people to be sons and daughters of the great king. We are therefore called to be separate. Promises of salvation come first. We see in the New Testament Christ has defeated Egypt. Christ has defeated the hordes of hell. Defeated death. He's defeated sin. 
but there are commands and laws that do come after. And when we begin to see this, then we are to be able to obey, not out of fear of judgment, but out of the thankful gratitude of the one who has done all of this through Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. Father, thank you for allowing us to look at Genesis chapter 47 this morning. Father, we can't control nature. We can't control politics. We can't control our own decisions sometimes. And yet, despite our decisions, despite everything else in this life, you are still working out your purposes and your plan in our life. Father, help us to trust you today. Help us to be thankfully obedient to your word. We say to us in your son's name. Amen. Let us stand and sing our final hymn this morning. God leads us along. God leads us along. Jesus' name.